Hey, squirrels, let's start the next book. Want to? Is this the fifth book? Doesn't say on here. But anyway, Charms and Firearms by Trixie Silvertail. And it has 22 chapters. Same as the one we just read. Chapter one. What did I say it was called? Charms and Charms and Firearms. Okay, chapter one. No matter how many times I press the embossed plaster medallion that opens the secret bookcase door for my swanky apartment to the rare books loft, it still blows me away. My grandmother left this entire bookshop to me. I mumble under my breath. You've come a long way, baby. Who remembers that commercial? It's a cigarette commercial. A year ago, I lived in a rundown studio apartment in Sedona, Arizona. Gosh, all that stuff that's happened to her happened in a year. If you had suggested that a frumpy little man with a large mustache and a wrinkled brown suit would knock on my door and hand me an envelope filled with a new future, I would have laughed in your face and likely refused to make your coffee order on the grounds that you were insane. I knew she worked at the coffee shop. Turn the page. At the time, I was a broke barista with sporadic hot water, but today I'm runway walking across a fine Persian rug in a, tr in a pair of T-strap Valentinos while the sound of a vintage Marchesa swishes over my ample thighs. I'm hosting a fundraiser for the Penn Cherry Harbor Animal Shelter. I've never hosted a fundraiser before, not because I don't have a soft spot in my heart for a number of charitable causes, but because I never had the money. So today I'm hosting for two reasons. One, my dad's new girlfriend is on the board of directors at the animal shelter, and number two, my grandmother, God rest her, absolutely loves to dress me up like a little doll. And you heard me correctly. My grandmother passed away and left the wealth of her five ex-husbands and the beautiful bell book and candle to me. However, her ghost still resides in the bookshop. And I hope it never leaves. It didn't say that. I said that. And I also received her spoiled rotten cat as part of the bargain. Now, don't you go say anything bad about Mr. Cuddlekins. That cat has saved your life more times than I care to mention. And yet, she's mentioning it. I spin on my five-inch designer heels and firmly fix a fist on each of my hips. Grams, I can't believe we're having this discussion again. If these lips aren't moving... You're not part of the conversation. No thought dropping and definitely no interjecting your opinion into my internal dialogue. It wasn't for my sake, dear. I was defending Piwack at Rial. And that would be Mr. Cuddlekins, who's known as Piwack to the rest of us. He's an eerily intuitive fur baby with an addiction to children's sugared cereal. And a penchant for getting his whiskers into death-defying trouble. Hey, are you going to come down here and help me set up? Or am I going to need to hire more servants, your highness? The cacophonous hmm, intonations of my volunteer employee, Twiggy, drift up from the first floor. She was my grandmother's best friend in life, and her severe gray pixie dungarees and biker boots stomp around my bookshop free of charge. She works for the entertainment, not the cash. With a pleasing inhalation of book-rich air, I firmly grip the wrought iron railing on the circular staircase leading down to the main floor. 
of the shop and do my best to to navigate the narrow wedge-shaped treads as I descend into the bowels of the bookstore. I unhook the no admittance chain at the bottom of the stairs, but before I can even step off the final stair, I'm already being ad admonished. Twiggy's disembodied voice echoes off the tin-plated ceiling. You be sure to hook that chain back up, doll. This place is going to be crawling with looky-loos. Unless I missed a memo, the silent auction is set up in the rare books loft. I think we're going to have to allow people access if we want them to actually place bids. I grin at my own witty response. Twiggy stomps out from between the stacks and fixes me with an irritated glare. I wasn't born yesterday. I hired security for the event. Once they get here, I'll unhook the chain. I roll my eyes but don't have the guts to argue. One of the things I clearly don't grasp about my rare books collection is the actual monetary value of those ancient leather-bound tomes. The fact that the key to binding my grandma's spirit to this place was uncovered in one of them should give me a hint. I mean, it's hard to place a value on the family. Walking toward the, the caterer, I hope to have a more pleasant interaction. Do you need any help setting up, Anne? The owner of Bless Chow, the patisserie on the 3rd Avenue, shakes her head. Absolutely not. I wouldn't dream of taking a chance on you getting something on that gorgeous gown. At least give me the delicious details so I can plan my attack. She beams with pride. We have strawberry tartlets with hazelnut chocolate paw prints, grilled eggplant canopies with smoked gouda, individually packed souvenir sugar cookies with the shelter's lo logo and royal icing, and of course, pin cherry cheesecake bars. My mouth is definitely watering. Everything looks amazing. Are you, sh are you sure there's nothing I can do? She blushes and faints feigns a curtsy. Thank you. I've got things under control here. Maybe Amaryllis could use a hand at the sign-in table. Amaryllis is her dad's girlfriend, I think. I glance toward a small table set up in front of the colorful children's book section and catch my father, Jacob Duncan, proudly appraising my outfit. Hey, Dad. Your grandmother must be, would be, so proud. He gives me a wink and his cheeks flush a little at the slip up. He and I share our genetically bone white blonde hair and our mysterious gray eyes. And we also share the secret of the ghost of my grandmother's past. Actually, my father, Twiggy, myself, and my grandmother's former lawyer, Silas Willoughby, are the only people who know Grams didn't actually cross over. Hey, Amaryllis, is there anything I can do to help? She looks up from a table arranged with brochures, pens, a will call list, and a cash box. The little wrinkles around her brown eyes are the only indication of worry. I haven't known her long, but she's a competent attorney that worked for my grandfather before he passed and continues to manage the Duncan estate that was handed down to my father. Oh, Mitzi, I honestly think I have everything covered here, but I would really appreciate it if you'd greet the guests and let them know about the silent auction items upstairs. Of all the possible tasks she could give me, Social Butterfly would be my last choice. Of course, happy to help. I hope that was more convincing out loud than it sounded in my head. My dad crosses the room in a few large strides and scoops one strong arm around my shoulders. He leans his six foot and change frame toward me and whispers in my ear, at the risk of sounding too proud, Mom did a real nice job with the outfit. She always was partial to Marchesa. He gives me a little squeeze and my heart warms with the comfort of family that was stolen from me 
When my mother died in a car versus commuter train accident 10 years ago, at that time I had no idea who my father was and with no relatives to care for me, I wound up in the foster system. After more than six years of hard knocks under my belt, I learned to take care of myself and bury my emotions under a thick outer shell. When I quit my barista job at Hot Caf Kafka in Arizona and took a very smelly bus to almost Canada, I had no idea my strange triangular brass key would open a bookshop in a treasure trove of family secrets. <laughs> my ghost, my, as I lovingly call her, passed away at 61 after more than a year of severe illness. However, thanks to her attorney slash alchemist, Silas, she was able to stay on this side of the veil, complete with her many lovely rings, multitude, multiple strands of pearls, and a burgundy silken tulle, you guessed it, Marchesa gown. She was also fortunate enough to be able to take on the ghost age of her choice which for her is 35, so even though she's my grams, her appearance makes me feel almost like an older sister. Ah, Mitzi, that's the sweetest thing. Grams blast into 3D right before my eyes like an old-fashioned camera flashbulb. And I nearly pee from shock. Since I'm surrounded by strangers and can't give Grams a proper lecture, I'm forced to send her a telepathic scolding. Grams, I know you get a real kick out of scaring the bejesus out of me, but I'm all dressed up and I'm short on adult diapers. So if you could keep the pop-ins to a minimum and use the slow, sparkly re-entry that we've agreed on, I would greatly appreciate it. Of course, dear, how silly of me. If you assumed her tone was more patronizing than apologetic, you'd be quite accurate. Maybe you're a budding psychic like me. The food is laid out with flair on the buffet table, and the hors d'oeuvres and pastries look and, smell look and smell delicious. Despite my recovering alcoholic grandmother's protest, we will be serving champagne. Both Amaryllis and I agree that bidding tends to increase with the application of a little social lubricant. Before I have a chance to get in, uh, before I have a chance to get into another debate with Grams, the book to the alleyway opens, and two barking dogs tear into the bookshop. I have no idea where Piwacken is hiding, but those dogs are in for a terrible surprise if they think they can outsmart a spoiled caracal. Twiggy, where in all of Narnia did they come from? She fixes me with an exasperated stare. Perhaps I should refer to it as her usual expression. We can't very well raise money for an animal shelter without showing some animals. The finicky feline of your grandmother sure as shellac ain't gonna let nobody pet him. <laughs> well, you better get those dogs under control before Pie catches their scent. They'll never make it out of here alive. As you wish, your highness. Twiggy shuts the... Uh, Twiggy shuts the dogs in the back room, and I hope for their sakes Pie Wacket isn't already hiding in there. The first guest to arrive is our local veterinarian, Lido Sikkanen, Sikkanen, S-I-K-A-N-E-N, Sikkanen, Sikkanen. Pushing his wheelchair is my favorite waitress, Tally. Her hair is scooped into its signature tight flame red bun sitting atop her head. And she is bedecked in a lovely blue skirt and sweater set. Doc Lido, so good to see you. How are your modifications going at the clinic? Were you able to get the new adjustment, new adjustable surgical table? Doc Lido shakes his head warmly as he replies, Things couldn't be better. It took me a month or two to adjust to the wheelchair. And, wait a minute. 
And right now, I'm only working three days a week in the clinic, but I'm assisting the traveling vet on surgeries, and if all goes well, I should be back to work full-time next month and handling all the surgeries myself. Tally smiles and lovingly pats her brother on the shoulder. You know him, always the optimist. Some days he acts like that hit-and-run accident was the best thing ever happened to him. <laughs> She shrugs her shoulders and casts her emotion-filled eyes heavenward. Well, I'm glad things are working out, and I know your patients will be pleased to have you back full term. Not that the traveling veterinarian isn't a lovely woman, but when I had to take Powacken in for his rabies shot last month, she almost lost a finger. Chocolito and I share a chuckle, and the flick of a stubby tail catches my eye. I point to the top of one of the bookshelves, and Leto follows the gesture. He grins and nods. Oh, Powacket, I hear you miss me. Powacket gracefully leaps down from the bookcase, and a blur of tan struts across the floor like he owns the place. And let's be honest, he might as well. And rubs against the doctor's legs. Tally and I share an uneasy share an uneasy glance. Doc Leto doesn't miss a beat. He leans down and scratches Piwacket's head right between his black tufted ears. I'm afraid that these old legs can't fully appreciate your generous affections, Pie, but I sure am happy to see you looking so healthy. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were never, I'd say you never age. Real can confirm. I chuckle under my breath. I've often thought the same thing about Piwacket and always wondered how old he really is. Graham's claims she won him in, a, in an off-the-book Scrabble game, but I seem to remember my dad <clears throat> sharing memories of Piwacket being around when he was a child. No time for that conundrum. I hope you'll both excuse me. Guests are pouring in, and it's my job as the hostess with the mostest to get uh, mostest to get them properly orient, oriented and make sure they know about the silent auction items upstairs. As soon as I say it, I feel sick to my stomach. Tally's eyes widen. I'm sorry, Doc. That was really thoughtless. I don't know. Doc Lido reaches out and grabs my hand. He gives it a fatherly pat. No need to apologize, Mitzi. I know your heart's in the right place. And hosting this event is a huge undertaking. I'm sure I can convince Tally to run upstairs and place a few bids for me. I smile uncomfortably and can't seem I <laughs> can't seem to get my feet to move. Tally nods. Well you better get to the rest of the guests. As I shuffle off, I feel the heat rising in my cheeks. Hurrying toward the steady stream of potential donors, a fresh wave of warm a fresh wave of warm swirls through my tummy when I see a familiar and handsome face. Mr. Bombay, how good of you to come to our little soiree. Rory scoops an arm around my waist and leans his face dangerously close to mine. Uh I wouldn't miss it for the world, Mazithra. <laughs> well played. We both chuckle, and I'm the first to relent and abandon formalities. Oh, it's good to see you, Rory. Do you have any exciting new artifacts on the antique at the antiquity shop? Perhaps I can convince you to join me in a grand files in grand files for lunch later this week. Perhaps. His devilish chuckle sends a ripple of tingles through my tummy, and I'm just about to abandon my hostess duties when I catch my father's stern gaze through the crowd. Rory, we'll catch up later. I have to greet the guests. 
Of course, Mitzi, I can entertain myself. The hairs on the back of my neck stand on end and the magic mood ring on my left hand sparks with heat. I resist the urge to look at it and see if there's a psychic message. Instead, I swish it away in my designer dress and head to the front door. Odell must have closed the diner early. His gray buzz cut bobs up and down as he jostles through the line, winding along the red velvet ropes, and the sight of him brings a genuine smile to my face. I shake several hands, distribute a few brochures, and highlight a couple of our amazing silent auction items as I work my way uh, work my way through the new arrivals. When I finally catch Odell, he's looking crankier than usual. Thanks for for braving the crowds. He shrugs and exhales. Isadora always had a soft spot for animals. Grams would be touched that you came. I give him the command. No. I give him the canned welcome speech and add that I promise to see him for breakfast in the morning. <clears throat> Hang on, I lost my dog in the place. Uh, gave him the canned welcome speech and add that I promised to see him for breakfast in the morning. Twiggy still hasn't unhooked the chain. If we want to get these silent auction items out the door, I'll have to start the bidding. Walking toward the circular staircase, the sound of the metal door to the alley slamming shut catches my attention. I look toward the makeshift stage. <clears throat> Stage under the large six by six windows at the front of the bookstore, and Twiggy is fussing over the two pups on display. <clears throat> Definitely wasn't her. A wave of concern washes over me, and I hurry toward the back door, running smack dab into the delicious specimen known as Sheriff Eric Harper. Eric, I didn't expect to see you tonight. Is Sheriff Harper, Miss Moon, and I'm on duty. Twiggy asked me to work security in the rear books loft. I can't help but chuckle. He manages to keep a serious face as he nods 10-4. I laugh and place a hand on his arm. Then it's your job to officially unhook the chain. I gesture toward the circular staircase. He nods affirmatively and a lovely strand of his blonde hair falls across his face. He quickly slicks it back in place without one hand, with one hand. <laughs> As his blue-gray eyes sparkle with playfulness, he unhooks the chain and climbs the staircase. I can't help but watch. <laughs> I mean, everybody's got a weakness. Unfortunately, my weakness tends to involve forgetting that I'm in a room full of people. And the next thing I know, I've been... And the next thing I know, I've been caught red-handed <laughs> looking at him. Are you certain there's nothing I should know about you and the sheriff? Rory's green eyes stare at me intently as he narrows his gaze. My clear sentience picks up on a strong dose of jealousy, which I promptly ignore. I don't think so, but just to be clear, I am a free agent. I give him a wink and walk toward the front of the bookstore with an extra little swish in my swag. Swagger. And that's it. We'll stop there. We'll be in chapter two. Uh, what did I say it was? Charms and firearms. Bookmark. 
Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly.